Coming up on this week in computer hardware, Intel 9900K, we got a review, and it's not all about gaming. GTX 1060's got a memory upgrade, and you might want to look for it. Everybody loves the iPhone XR and more. It's all coming up on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 489, recorded on October 25th, 2018. Intel Core i9 and a big surprise. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Casper, a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. You can save $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash twitch and using the promo code twitch at checkout. Welcome to Twitch, this week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most engaging, most informative, and today, possibly the saddest news in PC hardware, at least on the Twit Network. I'm Patrick Norton, joined today and forevermore by Mr. Alan Malventano, who is apparently, I understand that you have photos of such an incriminating nature, Ryan has walked away from the business, handed it to you and Ken. <laughs> And we'll never show his face in a public media stream again. Yeah, yeah, we finally uh, blackmailed him sufficiently uh, to get him Hopefully to leave. He's smiling in the background. Uh, I, he is, I, he's I laughing, think, actually. Because I am sad, but uh, there's a post up on PCPer.com called The Beginning of a New Journey. And in it, Mr. Shrout explains that uh, he has been such a gadfly, such a consistent force for good for the consumer in the industry. Intel has decided to uh, take his 19 years of experience in benchmarking and, uh, uh, and, and I, I might go so far as to say hellish experience in benchmarking because nobody benchmarks for that long without some kind of permanent scarring. Uh, Alan is, Alan, Ryan is also, actually Alan and Ryan have advanced the benchmarks in their fields and pushed entire industries forward to actually pay attention to the most important things to determine the performance of their products. And, uh, yeah. you know... Starting today, I quote, I will no longer be involved with PC Perspective or the content that will be posted. And uh, he's relinquishing ownership of the site to the team. He's removing himself from all aspects of finance as content prior to his Intel start date. And uh, Ryan's going to be the chief performance strategist at, at Intel. Uh, and the idea, I think, is that he is going to make Intel be better about how it measures the performance of its products, uh, of its products. And uh, I can't think of anybody I know of more suited for that. And, uh, and I, I don't want to get all maudlin and sad because, you know, Ryan and I have done several hundred of these podcasts, uh, <laughs> sometimes yeah. stuffed in corners of large buildings full of angry people or confused people or just people. Uh, suffering from low blood sugar at CES in San Francisco, in Petaluma, uh, but mostly over the internet, uh, often from hotel rooms, and usually uh, trying to figure out just what people should do about the endless fire hose of hardware that comes out on consoles and mobiles and, of course, desktop, GPUs. Um, and we've watched a lot of stuff kind of come and go. And uh, I, for one, I'm a little sad. Actually, I'm a lot sad uh, that I won't get to talk to Ryan each and every week. But I'm also really excited because, Alan, I understand that you and I will be carrying the Twitch flag forward. Moving, moving forward? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yep, and, yep. Uh, Ryan Shroud has been secretly replaced by Alan Malventano. Let's see if the uh, audience notices <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know, because I've been kind of subbing in uh, on and off as, you know, Ryan's been busy lately doing Shroud Research related things and traveling here, here, there and everywhere, which uh, I think was actually part of his reasoning for, uh, you know, when that offer did come along, like, you know, well, you mean I don't have to travel to a new different random place for each additional company that wants a contract <laughs> with my company because that's what was happening right it just turned into this right. storm of just he's got to be everywhere at once um and or you know he's got a week. kid he's got a family people with families generally don't kind of want to do that you know i mean i had a family and family. was on submarines so i could totally appreciate <laughs> not want to just be away for extended periods of time and traveling all over the place so you know i get it you know, and um, 
Ken and I and the other guys will will keep uh, we'll keep the lights on over here and you know keep reviewing the things. Um, so yeah, I mean you know uh, he ran yeah. it for 19 years. I'm sure I'm sure it's got some life left back in it. You know we can keep it going. One would hope. Um, um, and for I, a lot of people don't realize, you know, Ryan started PC Per when he was a high school senior. Yeah. Um, which A means he's incredibly young bastard, uh, and B means that I mean that's that's you know uh, you know another year and he'd get his pension um, if he was in any of uh, a number of fields that are not. Uh, well, that's why we kicked him out now publishing. because you know yeah we just didn't want didn't want him to make the cut for the the pension. So wow. if you if you fire that's, him a year before, then they don't get anything. That's um, cold, that's how chief. That's really cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so uh, case, you know uh, we've been. We've been ribbing them about the whole like corporate uh, culture thing, you know, sending them the pictures of the from the office space scene where the the uh, whiteboard in the background has planning to plan flowcharts on it and stuff, you know. Um, he's gonna have to, you well, know, do all the in, you know, he's he's going to a big company, right? It's gonna be like the first time he has to sit through some form of sexual harassment training. I just Ever. can't wait to have the conversation about the onboarding process and whether, you know, how many times he burst into tears during that. Uh, Cause I've done it three or four times. And by the third or fourth, I was pretty much bursting into tears on contact. But uh, now yeah. I just want to say, Ryan, uh, Ryan's going to be missed. And uh, I think Ryan's got a pretty amazing challenge that he's accepted. And uh, I'm excited to see what he does. At the very least, I'm excited to not be completely embarrassed by uh, some of Intel's benchmarking that comes from independent sources uh, to determine uh, the value of the product, but yeah, I mean, you know. I mean, if there's if there's one thing that Ryan's really good at, uh, and just generally us here, here is it, we can no, we can look at a set of numbers and go, okay, there's there's something wrong there. Like that's not you know that's not right. Um, just just based <laughs> on experience, right? Because we've you know kind of well, been doing this for a long time, so. There was also some irony in that I was texting Ryan and, and we were both kind of like, who actually believes the benchmarks from manufacturers anyway? So <laughs> well, that's that's the thing. And, and just generally speaking, it would be really nice if that changed because it's all too often yeah. that like anytime we get a set of slides in from anybody and they have some kind of performance numbers on the slides, if they're directly from a company, we're always right. immediately like in grain of salt mode, right? We're always like, okay, like... Definitely, the assumption is, yeah, we know they're cherry picking the best things. Like, and and if anything, they're probably swinging some things in their favor a little bit. Um, which is why generally you wait for the you know the review community uh, output to happen, right? You wait for the samples yes. to hit the reviewers. You wait for you know get get uh, some more data points before before you make your purchase, right? It goes for any company. It doesn't really matter who it is. Yeah. Um, and also, generally speaking, when a company refuses to give product out early, it usually means there's a story they're trying to craft in order to maximize sales, and it's probably not one that's going to hold up well after the products actually start shipping. So, yeah, I mean that's that may fair. Be a cynic. It's, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, it's I mean, fair, it's just, that's just going on. No, I mean, it's fair to say that based on um, like history, right? Right. Um, it's a fair <laughs> statement. Um, <laughs> and you know, yeah, that's that's usually what happens. Usually, if they're like, "Yeah, we're not going to send this one out," um, right? You know, it usually means they're just kind of like going to bide their time and wait for people to actually buy the product and and then let the bad news come out. It kind of gives them a you know a few extra weeks of time. Uh, we're going to sell will. a bunch up before people start being angry about it. Yeah. Shifting gears. This is technically uh -huh. not a show about lamenting the loss of friends. Uh, even if they are moving to amazing jobs he's, and incredible he's opportunities. Still, he's not dead yet, Patrick. He's still I know. He's still alive. He's just not on the uh, show. <laughs> I know what I, <laughs> you know, I I I <sighs> I uh <laughs> you know, Ryan's not dead to me, but I think according to the terms of his contract, the show's dead to him. So Well, um, okay, perhaps. Which given what is which is a smart move by all concerned but we should shift gears a little bit um and we were making fun of some benchmarks that came out of intel recently uh which were around the intel core i9-9900k mr addison who's probably somewhere in the room with you right now uh contemplating the joys of benchmarking in the future of pc per um he's, he's in the room review. with me uh he's in the room with me right now waiting for other cpu benchmarks to complete so yes he's He's definitely here. <laughs> because he has not suffered enough yet. The uh, it was interesting because uh, uh, you know 
looking at these benchmarks, um, you can honestly say that even without heavily tweaked benchmarks or heavily tweaked competition or, or, or basically in, you know, blunt, honest benchmarks that, you know, this pretty much is the fastest gaming processor you can buy. Um, yes. Yes. That is, that know. is still, uh, seems to be a true statement. Absolutely. Personally, I'm buying a $329 Ryzen 7 2700X before I'm buying a Core i9 9900K. Um, yes, which is, and that is know. because of the value proposition as opposed yeah. to the ultimate performance proposition, right? Like, you know, yeah. that's a, you get a Ryzen part for significantly less money. Um, well, let's have you look at Cinebench R15, single threaded. I mean, that's where, I think that's probably one of the glory benchmarks for the 9900K, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, but again, I mean, that's Cinebench. It's not gaming, right? You got to re got to really think of. Like, I spend a lot of time your, rendering, so workload? rendering benchmarks is is always kind of a a big thing for me. But when you're looking at that, I mean, well, okay, so I can't see the top of the benchmark right now. What are we looking at? Ashes of the Singularity Escalation 1080p, <laughs> obviously not CPU right, not bound. A, yeah, there's not a huge spread there, right? Um, mm -hmm. And again, that's only running a 1080p. But granted, it's Ashes, which is you know, it's kind of a decently heavy workload where even a 1080p right. the gpu is still doing a, a decent amount of work there uh to the point where it kind of diminishes uh the spread that you see on the cpu side that's just mm -hmm. that's just generally how benchmarks in general work right there's usually a, a bottleneck someplace depending on whatever the workload is uh and sometimes you're kind of right on the fine line there like and that's very much the case in just modern systems where sometimes the bottleneck for one given uh given game might be the CPU, whereas you might fire up mm -hmm. a different game or just slightly different settings and the bottleneck might shift over to the GPU where you might see a, you know, and then suddenly the CPU doesn't matter as much, right? And then it's really right. down to the point of, you know, does it get the job done reasonably quickly? And if so, performance will be just fine, right? Um, but that said, I mean, just generally speaking across CPUs, like eh, CPUs usually, you know, do okay. Like, it's, it's, CPU is not the sub some super critical thing uh, right. in modern day games where, you know, it's just, it's a game. It's trying to render things to the display. It makes more sense that the the workload would be a little bit heavier on the GPU side anyway. Um, but there are some cases like right there where it's what's scrolling by and Civ. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that game seems to be leaning a little more on the CPU, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then you do see a spread. And in that case, uh, that 9900K is, is just is able to dominate the field, right? Um, right. But, you know, but uh, it's it is a spread there. Like it's you can't really argue that it's not a huge difference when uh, you know that 2700X. You're, you're talking like what is that like 15, uh, almost tw actually it's like a 20% reduction. Yeah. When you drop down to that that part. But again, that's only if you're after that one particular workload slash game, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're more on a budget, that that part could you know still be for you and can still get the job done, right? Um, so, do things change as you as you move out of 1080p performance, or did you guys kind of avoid looking at you know 4K performance? I guess there probably wasn't much point. You wouldn't be oh yeah at that I mean, point as you as you shift you. Yeah, as you shift up there, the the perform the the delta pretty much evaporates on the CPU mm -hmm. side. Um, when you get into if you get all the way up to 4K resolutions, um, I'm not sure if uh, Ken did uh, 1440p in this particular piece or not, or just decided to focus on 1080p. I think for time uh, time considerations, he stuck with the 1080p. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we will also show the next rung up on resolution to kind of give an idea of what, the, you know, where, where is the point where that bottleneck shifts. Um, but probably safe to say that, you know, once you had 1440p or above in, in modern titles, you, you know, as long as your, uh, as long as your frame rates are still going to be sticking somewhere around 60, mm -hmm. uh, you know, then uh, again, CPUs kind of become a wash. Um, so let's see, uh, there was an, Iometer test. Actually, I was I worked with Ken briefly on this one to just uh, mm -hmm. we're trying to show like is there a way to see what change happens due to this whole specter and meltdown thing because specter and meltdown affects storage related performance pretty heavily, 
Um, right. Especially like random access and whatnot. And we were trying to figure out, well, there's supposed to be some changes and some variants of Spectre and Meltdown or mitigated and hardware on on this revision versus on, you know, previous uh, previous Intel CPUs. Like, what can we do? And I was, and I just thought to myself, well, you could just run something like Iometer on a RAM disk. Just run it on something where you know that the limit is not really, you know, you want the CPU to be the bottleneck. And uh, mm -hmm. I just know from personal experience using tools like Iometer that there's actually a case where uh, a single thread that can only do so many random operations per second, uh, you know, at such a high rate before the storage is no longer the bottleneck and now the CPU is. So same story as before where we're talking about the bottleneck being a CPU or GPU for a game. For storage performance, it's either the storage or the CPU, depending on, you know, what you're doing and what kind of workload it is. So we set up a workload that was going to go after uh, sort of to, to evaluate the CPU's ability to handle storage. In, in a given version of Windows and with the given state of the Spectre and Meltdown landscape. Um, and looking at those results, so we were testing reads and writes because the Spectre Meltdown stuff impacts reads and writes differently. Um, there were some things that were surprising to me because uh, our standard storage testbed uh, is still like this x99 system that was reasonably beefy at the time, like the CPU is overclocked and we try to when we do our storage testing, we don't want the CPU to be the bottleneck, right? Um, mm -hmm. Back when I was tuning that system and setting up all those workloads, uh, the the maximum IOPS that a single thread could hit on that particular system, again, like high-end system, but a few years back, the, it would saturate at like 200,000, 220,000, something like that. Uh, right. And now we have like modern processors like 9900K, they're doing almost, well, a little bit, under and a little bit over 400,000. So like storage performance is nearly doubled in, in relation to how quickly can the system turn that, that request around? Um, how quickly can it get through all the different steps that a request for information has to go through, through the whole kernel and, you know, and all those links in the chain has to make, you know, make it through all the layers out to the device and then back, right? Um, so just an interesting tidbit there. Um, also interesting is uh, that there is kind of a penalty that the Ryzen slash Threadripper CPUs see. Uh, probably, it's not necessarily because of optimizations or just how modern they are. It's really just because there's extra latency penalties related with the way that things have to, the way that, uh, you know, information has to transit between the RAM and the cores on those, on those platforms. Uh, this is, you know, that infinity fabric latency related thing that we're always talking about when we when we deal with the AMD side. Um, so it's kind of just a limitation of the architecture. And you can actually, I know Ken did do testing there, but like if you were to do things like overclock the memory further on the Threadripper systems or on the AMD systems, you might actually bring those numbers higher. Um, you know, it's just it, the bottleneck sort of becomes the the fabric within the CPU and whatnot. It anyway, seems like... Um, you know, all that all that stuff aside, uh, it really comes down to, you know, if you want if you want the fastest thing, right? Uh, this is kind of your bet, but you're gonna have to pay for it, right? Uh, the price is supposed mm -hmm. to be around five hundred dollars, but so far yeah, we've only seen it. We've only seen it for like what five eighty, yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely don't buy one right this moment, even if you're interested in it. It's probably worth <laughs> waiting a few weeks to, for hopefully that price to become a little bit more sane, right? Um, uh, but and, and, well, and the other thing is like, while well, most of the people who are listening to this podcast would probably automatically buy an aftermarket air cooler or an aftermarket liquid cooler. Um, it's, you know, you're talking like right now, 580, maybe it'll be down to 530. You're absolutely going to have to buy an aftermarket cooler for this. There's no cooler in the box on this one. Um, right. I also, I mean, looking at the benchmarks, it seems like anything you're doing that's got a ton of I.O. is going to have an advantage running under the, the 9900K, um, you know, like workstation type stuff or content creation type stuff, um, you know, which for me is like the, the whole focus of this has been gaming. Um, but, you know, there's there's some pretty impressive, you know, performance attributes to this that are not just straight, you know, four threads or smaller uh, CPU abuse. Um, Right, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, so 
you know, the best thing I can suggest to you is just, you know, look at your budget. This is just the, your general, like, CPU buying advice. They'll like, look at your budget. Right. How much do you want to spend? What's your use cases? What kinds of things are you going to do with the system? And then go through a review like Ken's or anybody else for that matter. If you don't, you know, don't, don't always just look at one review, but you should probably look at several to get the, the bigger picture. Um, mm -hmm. And once you've, you know, look, look for the particular benchmarks that are going to be close to the kinds of things you see yourself doing with it. And okay, which thing looks like the best thing? You know, if right. you're looking at only, if you're looking at only the types of games where even at 1080p, there's not that big of a spread, then you don't really have to worry about which type of CPU you're after. You're probably more worried about the GPU, right? I'm always worried about the GPU. Yeah. Always. Oh, my goodness. Uh, no word on the majority of the Adobe products at this point, but NVIDIA has announced RTX has come to Adobe Dimension CC. Um, that uh, took place at the Adobe Max conference earlier this week. And um, this is not something you ever hear people talk about unless you're in a very narrow corner of the, uh, of the industry. Um, but I'm very curious to see. This is something I was thinking about immediately when they announced RTX was, when is this going to show up? Can this show up? Can they use this in some way that's going to accelerate Photoshop and, of course, uh, Premiere? Just other things. But, uh, Just accelerating yeah. anything in general, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but at this point, there's there's some, some very direct uses they can get inside of uh, Adobe Dimension on this one. I'm also, um, you know, again, like everybody else, waiting for the RTX games to ship, which pretty much means waiting for a few more weeks. It'd be nice if they started showing up before Black Friday. I'm just saying. And, yeah. you know, some sub-215 millimeter uh, 2070s would be nice, too. <laughs> or 2060s. <laughs> also true. Oh, my goodness. How... Uh... So what? we're used to AMD dropping the stealth announcements, and uh, I, I like the title on this one. Shopping for a GTX 1060. Hold up a moment, will you? There's been a silent release from NVIDIA, um, GDDR 5X, uh, which means, so if you're shopping for a 1060, you're probably automatically you know, skipping the three gigabyte versions of the card to search for a six gigabyte version of the card. Um, but uh, now there are four versions, not just a three gig and a six gig version. There's... Um, Three and six gig versions of the 1060 with the previous eight gigabit per second spec. There's a new six gigabyte model with uh, a little bit better GDDR5 that could hit nine gigabits per second and a six gigabyte chip with GDDR5X. Uh, we don't know what the frequency or the bandwidth specs are on those. Um, but I, I feel like we've just entered this super awesome hot mess phase of GTX 1060 distribution where. Uh, I mean, know, they probably it, have some more. They probably have some more of those that they just need to move, right? Right. Um, and they had this newer memory line around, and they probably figured out, well, we can make it work with that. Like, why not just do it? Um, right. You know, and if it kind of spurs up a little bit more interest in it, because, again, those those cards will perform better, better with that, you know, faster memory attached. Um, it's not going to be just, uh, you know, uh, some amazing improvement, but it will be an improvement nonetheless. Right. Um, but we're talking like single digits, not double digits in terms of performance improvement. Probably, yeah. yeah. Uh, but if you get a little more out of it, it might be it might sway a few people that were on the fence into going for this instead of waiting for any of the you know the lower cost twenty whatevers, uh, you know, to launch. Uh, and even when they do, even if there was a twenty sixty, like right this mm -hmm. moment, it's not going to be in that price range. There's just no way uh, based on right. you know what we've been seeing so far. Uh, it might be close, but it's still going to be a more expensive card. Um, you know, so I mean, if you're okay with that and you're not worried about the RTX stuff, then <laughs> you could potentially get a good deal on that. Especially, you know, imagine cards like this uh, being around during Black Friday sales, where again they're just trying to move those last ones so they can move on, uh, right. you know, to all the newer, newer, shinier RTX uh, hardware. Um, well, and again, I mean, the whole reason behind the stealth thing, you know, I'd imagine. Uh, no need to really draw that much attention to an update to the pre previous line when you're really trying to shine all the spotlights on the new the new stuff, right? Um, you know. Well, it's also, I mean, it it should be uh, it should be no. I mean, I think we need to remind everybody that in theory, a 2060 is coming. Now, I have you know, I, you think they're emptying out inventory. I wonder if they're just going to try to stretch out the 1060s until the new year. Um, 
uh, you know, I mean, they could. What the yields are like they could. Um, but you know, if you buy a 2060, you'll probably be paying at least a hundred dollars more for the card, but you're also going to get performance probably equivalent to a 1070, all of which is conjecture because nobody's seen a 2060 yet outside of NVIDIA. Um, but, uh, you know, I feel I, I, I really want to buy a new GPU right now, but I don't want to buy a new GPU. You know, I don't want to save a hundred dollars, but miss a big chunk of performance because I bought a 1070 uh, rather than waiting. I, it's it's just a, you know, if you don't yeah, have a lot, a lot of, of cash. Question marks it's now. always that trade off. Yeah, and it's there, not even so much at this point about then, RTX. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but on the, on the RTX front, we're not even absolutely sure long term how that extra hardware on those cards is going to play out. So, right. you know, um, yeah, that's kind of like that's kind of like a dice roll there. But if you're just like a typical gamer type, that's probably not going to be so worried about RTX effects in a you know in all the games because it's, it's not going to be it's only it's going to be in like handfuls of titles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's almost like those games that were optimized for a given. Like, remember back in the day where you had, like, a S3 Verge or you had some other GPU with this extra little chip on it or extra little hardware that could do <laughs> some particular fancy rendering thing, right? And then there would be, right. you know, there would be the, the Mech Warrior uh, release for that particular, because there was, like, six different Mech Warrior releases or something. There'd be, like, you know, some game that would be for all these different uh, kind of niche little hardware variants. But it's not like all games would do that, right? It would just be, right. here's this extra feature. Now, we don't know... If it's going to turn into a much bigger thing than that, I would imagine, since now you have one of the major GPU makers adding this hardware to what, you know, in a couple of years from now, presumably you'd have a decent number of people that had that hardware, and maybe that would coax some more developers than average to, you know, kind of like make that, you know, take advantage of that extra hardware, right? Right. Um, but again, we haven't, we don't know how that's going to play out yet. <laughs> I suspect we'll find out sooner than we think. Because yep. it's practically November, and everybody needs to reveal everything they want to sell by November. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Micron, planning on buying Intel out of the Micron Flash Technologies Group. Does that mean, I mean, what does this exactly mean for consumers? <laughs> it's a little bit complicated. Uh, so the way that 3D Crosspoint is produced, and that is the uh, memory, the media that is in all of those Intel Optane SSDs you've seen floating mm -hmm. around over the past year or two. Um, uh, the Intel and Micron have developed that memory. Uh, it was jointly announced between both companies. It's produced at a, a fab in Lehigh, Utah, um, which is the IMFT fab. It's just the Intel Micron. It's like a joint venture and trying to develop new media, new storage devices, that sort of thing. And uh, mm -hmm. so out of that venture has come 3D Crosspoint, and it's also come like uh, 3D NAND and other things, other advances in, in flash memory as well. Um, but over the past year or two, that's sort of been winding down. So Intel and Micron have, so far have agreed, okay, like we're going to start phasing out of this joint thing. We're going to part ways. Um, right. In part of that agreement, uh, Micron has an option if they choose to uh, come, I think, January, they can say, we want to buy out Intel's half of the fab, uh, which basically means that, you know, and there would be some sort of transition period, uh, presumably like another six to 12 months or something where, you know, they got to pack their, Intel has to pack their stuff and get out, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. equipment stays, they're, you know, making all the equipment to make all the wafers and everything. But uh, it's basically like officially splitting the venture, right? As it is right now, if if Intel wanted more 3D Crosspoint uh, than they were producing, they have to buy it from Micron's half, right? Because whatever's coming out of the fab gets sort of split down the middle. Um, as far as I understand... That's the only fab currently that makes that media. Um, meaning that if uh, Micron exercises the option, then over a six to 12 month period or whatever, then Intel has been kind of like phased out of that fab. And now Micron is doing all of that production. Uh, Intel would either have to buy it, buy 3D Crosspoint media from Micron, as opposed to having mm -hmm. some that they've made themselves, right? Um, or Intel would just have to take their uh, IP, which is a, an important point in this. Like they can, Intel can still produce 3D Crosspoint or 3D NAND or the things that they have developed jointly with Micron. Uh, Micron's not buying out the intellectual property. Uh, they're just buying out the fab. Um, so Intel's free to go and okay. 
they have other fabs, they can make it somewhere else. I would imagine it would take some time to spin that up, but it's possible. So, you know, it's 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 hard to really. When I heard about this initially, I was kind of taken aback by it because I Micron has not historically been the company to push that technology. They're not the ones talking about 3D crosspoint left and right. They actually have a brand name for it, which is called Quantex, but you you don't really hear Quantex anything coming out of Micron, whereas Intel every few months is launching yet another product that has Optane memory written on it and contains that media, right? So if um, if anything, it's been Intel that's really been the ones shipping that product up till now. Um, maybe I would imagine Micron probably has plans to do something more with it than what they've been doing so far, which has been not really anything. Um, mm. But won't really know until uh, you know the, the proof will have to be in the pudding. We'll have to see what actually plays out, but. Uh, that particular move that Micron wants to do is probably a good a good uh, suggester that uh, you know don't buy and your don't buy your your uh, soon to be competitors half of a fab if you don't plan on actually doing something with the things that the fab can make. So, pretty sure Micron <laughs> intends to do something uh, w with it there. You know, or maybe, maybe they just want to <laughs> maybe they just want the machinery to. Well, the, I mean, it, it is a pretty good deal, um, right? Because uh, I don't want to get into the minutia of like the agreement and how that works, but basically the amount of money that Micron would have to pay to buy out Intel's half is a good deal, as far as like market analysts go. And you know, it, it's it's not easy to just get uh, an up and running, fully operational fab all to yourself these days, <laughs> right? <laughs> there's there's. Lots right. of considerable costs, and I think the what fully Micron operational would be part being a, a big part of that. Yeah, it's like <laughs> do you do you buy do you just have half of the Death Star, or do you have <laughs> what if you could just what if you could just have the whole Death Star for like a deal for just basically the parts of or the cost of materials, right? As opposed to all of the labor to have built the fab and things like that. So, so start yeah, selling I mean, yeah. in the center. Death stars and <laughs> rental and build rates. Rent, and how do you rent, require rent to it? own? Rent to own. Rent 3D your cross death memory star fab. to own. Oh yeah, my goodness! Yeah. This is Micron's half. <laughs> yeah, that's Micron's <laughs> half. And then they still, they still need to get Intel's half. Uh, so you know. Oh my goodness! This episode, ladies and gentlemen, of this week in computer hardware is brought to you by Casper. Casper is an online retailer, premium mattresses. For a fraction of the cost. Casper's revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with the resellers and showrooms and passing the savings directly to the consumer. That's you. If you've ever purchased a mattress, um, you know, it's, uh, I think the, the only thing worse than buying a mattress is buying a car. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there's just so many things they do to make it impossible to comparison shop or take advantage of the deals and the flyers. Um, and a lot of mattresses just flat out suck. Casper's mattress, though, it's obsessively engineered. They're trying to they're trying to create an amazing mattress at a fair price. The original Casper mattress combines multiple supportive memory foams for a sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. Plus, its breathable design helps you sleep cool and regulate your temperature through the night. If you have difficulty sleeping, might be your mattress, right? Think about it. A Casper mattress, you're talking about long-lasting comfort and support. You can buy it easily online. It is completely risk-free. Think about it. You probably spend a third of your life on that mattress. I mean, presumably you're sleeping on the mattress and not on the floor or the couch. I hope you're sleeping on your mattress. Casper, they're giving you a chance to try that out. Free delivery, painless returns within a 100-day period so you don't have to lie down in a showroom, which is kind of gross. Um, or maybe it was just the showroom I was last in, but I'm just saying. A clean Brand new mattress delivered to your house. You got 100 days to try it out. Casper mattresses uphold the highest environmental production standards and are made in the USA. Free shipping and returns to the USA and Canada. Get a Casper mattress today. It's time to sleep better, people. Get a Casper mattress today. You can save $50 towards select mattresses by going to casper.com slash twitch and entering the promo code twitch at checkout. That's casper.com slash T-W-I-C-H with the promo code twitch to save $50 on select mattresses. Terms and conditions apply, and we want to thank Casper for their support of this weekend computer hardware. HyperX... Uh, 
I got to say, HyperX, uh, which is like a Kingston sub-brand, HyperX had been doing some fantastic mechanical keyboards, some good mice. Um, I'm really impressed by the headsets, the gaming headsets they're creating, given the the, the performance you're getting for the money you're investing uh, is pretty fantastic. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little cranky about gaming headsets right now. Um, Jeremy wrote this up, but the, the Hyper Savage XO USB SSD X or 10? <laughs> is, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. It's probably, it's probably X. Let's call it X because it is Hyper, Hyper X. Yeah, given the Hyper X thing, yeah. Oh, um, my goodness. Yes. So we're, we're seeing uh, external portable drives like this launch, although this one's probably not meant to be marketed more for portable. They're just looking for the people that want to hook an SSD up to their console. Um, so, you know, you just need a sharp looking product, especially if it's potentially going to be sitting next to the console and it's going to be like in your entertainment center, like right there in your living room. You kind of want the thing to be a little bit flashy, right? Uh, no LEDs or anything, but, you know, sharp looking, sharp looking housing for the SSD. Um, now, this gets a little bit confusing. I was flipping through this review. We haven't tested this particular uh, HyperX product yet, um, but... There's usually this thing where uh, USB 3.0 gets confusing because you don't know if it's Gen 1, Gen 2, 5 gigabit, 10 gigabit. Like there's these different variants, even for with whether it's USB-C or not, like all these different things. Uh, and then to add that to the mix, you have all of these different ways of, in this case, trying to plug, uh, you know, uh, either uh, M.2 SATA or M.2 PCI Express. SSD internally inside one of these external housings, and then there's also whatever chip they're using to convert from one to the other, um, and to you know interface and, and make that translation. Um, we did a, we did sort of a roundup piece a while back where we were testing one of the Samsung new Samsung SSD, and then we had a bunch of these other um, external, uh, some fast, not so fast, or some not so fast, uh, you know, portable type SSDs. Um, if you want to go the, the, you know, some of these uh, externals that have a, an NVMe SSD in them will try to directly link that NVMe part over Thunderbolt. Then you can get potentially the fastest connection to the system, but pretty much only going to work on laptops or a desktop. If you have like a special, you have to have special hardware in there. It's definitely not going to work on consoles. Um, so the safer way to go is to stick with something that's going to convert to USB. If it has a really fast SSD internally, it needs to not be PCI Express as far as its link. It needs to be USB, some form of USB. So USB is much more graceful, being backwards compatible, that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But flipping through the test for this particular part, it looked like it wasn't that fast. Uh, I thought it was advertised, uh, I believe it was advertised as uh, Gen 2 USB 3.1. Um, Problem was pretty much all the sequentials and, and whatnot. They were they tended to be around 500 meg per second, uh, which kind of suggests that it, it would it was just going uh, USB 3.1 Gen 1 speed, five gigabit per second. Um, mm -hmm. Because fi five gigabit per, five gigabit per second is a, around the throughput that you would get for a serial ATA device, which is usually six gigabit per second. So it's around that 500 meg per second range. So if you see something performing like that, chances are that's you know it's kind of kind of limited or held back by something. Maybe it's not negotiating at the faster speed, even though it's supposed to. Could be a cable issue. You know, there's all sorts of reasons that that cause that to not go that fast. It just it seemed to me that that should have went fast faster than it appeared to um, in their review. But I don't have any other data points to rely on, so I would just say for the moment it is what it is. Uh, now <laughs> plugging it into Plugging it into a console, is that going to be enough performance? Absolutely. 500 meg per second, like a console, where is a console possibly going to be downloading a game faster than 500 meg per second from anywhere, unless you happen to have a 5 gigabit uh, internet connection. And even then, I don't think the console can process the data that quickly. So, mm -mm. Uh, yeah, chances are not. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's, it'd, be, it'd be fine. Um especially if your system only has a SATA internal SSD, even if you don't plan on using this for gaming, which I know they're kind of marketing more, more towards gaming, but if you just want a portable external SSD, um, you know, as, as long as 500 meg per second is fast enough for you, then it'll be fine. Um, hmm. Yeah. There you have it. Um, possibly a Tempest in a teapot, <clears throat> but it's uh, an interesting TechCrunch article uh, with a lot of stuff going on inside of it. Um, 
you know, the straight lead is uh, Oculus co-founder is leaving Facebook after cancelization or cancellation would be a better word of rift to yeah. headsets. And uh, Brendan Ireeve, the co-founder, the former CEO of Oculus, he says he's out. Um, you know, uh, it, what it comes down to is, is uh, it sounds like he's taking know, his ball and going home. Right. Yeah, like, pretty much. Wanna, right. So, yeah, Rift Two was make a thing. the next generation. Yeah, he wanted to make a. He had a. He was building the next generation PC based, leading edge, you know, VR product. Um, you know, and I, I, it's you know, it seems like he feels that uh, Facebook is lowering the standards. You could also say democratizing the standards, but going for self contained headsets like the Oculus Go. Um, and of course we've, we've got, uh, you know, the, the next generation standalone headset coming next year. Um, the Oculus quest <sighs> and, you know, there was a big, uh, you know, an update that came out quote, while Facebook did not deny a report that the Rift 2 being developed under Reeves PC VR team had been canceled. The company reiterated to us in a comment that they are continuing to invest in PC while we can't comment on our f product roadmap specifics, we do have future plans and can confirm that we are planning for a future version of Rift, a Facebook spokesperson told TechCrunch. Um, yeah, I mean, it just, so, it just sounds like your typical, you know, it's it, you were there to do a thing. It's not going the way that it, you had, were, you know, doing all that work and envisioned it to be. Right. Uh, to the point where, uh, you know, it was just not satisfying enough. For them, and they just they just left, you know. Yeah. Maybe to do it somewhere else. I mean, maybe to just do something different. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. And I'm I'm curious to see. You know, on one hand, I wouldn't entirely be surprised if if Facebook decided they didn't want to deal with all this PC fura and and really this is all about you know virtual nookie, and you know having a PC does not complement that that plan. Uh, I can also completely see that. Who knows? Maybe this project was a mess and they wanted to reboot the project with different leadership. Um, I hope they're not walking away from, you know, kind of the highest end of, of VR, but, um, at this point we just don't know. So I, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where this goes. I'm curious to see what happens with the whole concept of the Rift 2 and, uh, you know, cause I, I think it's going to have a huge influence on the future of VR. Um, you know, and it, it, yeah. the other thing is the, the TechCrunch article points out is, boy, a lot of founders have been leaving Facebook in the last year, <laughs> or at least the last few months, even. Um, right. Instagram co-founders, WhatsApp co-founder, uh, Jan Coom. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's it's a very big company with some very intense kind of uh, internal marching orders that I think come from above. I'm, I'm really curious to see what happens because I want to see VR continue to grow, and while I think it will scale better with self-contained, you know, like Qualcomm-based headsets, I'm not entirely sure that that the art of gaming is going to be advanced as fast on that. Who knows? Uh, we'll, we'll find out in a year or two. Uh, yeah. Something that made me particularly happy, happy, and and I should point out, iFixit has been a, a sponsor of this podcast and other podcasts at the Twit Network, but uh, iFixit. Um, <laughs> this is great. Um, yep. Motorola is iFixit's first major phone maker to supply official repair parts. Um, I just moved uh, to a Motorola G6, and uh, Motorola is going to be providing basically factory parts to iFixit to sell to repair Motorola phones, uh, primarily screens and batteries. And I am just delighted by that because I'm currently carrying a Motorola phone. And while uh, my tempered glass screens, I haven't had a broken screen since I started putting tempered glass protection on my cell phone screens. But now that I've said that, I'll probably shatter the screen I have right now. But at least I can find a, a source of factory parts. Um, other big news this week is a lot of the iPhone XR reviews have come out. And uh, uh, I thought Neil Patel over at The Verge had a really good way of, of describing it. There are other differences, um, but uh, how much would having a perfect display be worth to you? He writes, Apple has an answer, and it's $250. That's the price difference between the new iPhone XR and Apple's top-of-the-line iPhone XS. And uh, that's an interesting read. Um, there are also reviews... Uh, 
on the Wall Street Journal, uh, in Gadget, several other places. And uh, people seem to be really enthusiastic about this. No, it doesn't come in two sizes. No, it doesn't have the second camera. Uh, no, it's it's uh, not as high resolution. No, the screen isn't as amazing. But it's... Uh, I think it's uh, it sounded really good from the reviews so far. There have been some glitchy stuff happening with the cameras, but that sounds like something that will be solved in firmware. And if you want to talk about firmware repair or solutions, boy, it's an exciting week to be a Pixel 3 owner. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm not, I don't even want to get into there. If you have a Pixel 3, you have my sympathies. Uh, I'll be hearing about this a lot. Uh, when Shannon's ex, uh, with Shannon's Pixel 3 arrives, I think a little is shipping a little later this week. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a good looking phone. You know, it's got the same A12 processor. Uh, it's got a display that's probably better than the display you have right now if your phone is a couple of years old. Um, it's uh, and it comes in so many colors. <laughs> that's the thing that kind of blew my mind about this. Um, 256 gigabyte max on the capacity, uh, which again, if you have a couple year old phone, is is pretty phenomenal. Um, it's tempting. Uh, I will say, uh, you know, I am not particularly enamored of the camera inside of my Moto G6, but we just got a, a I just got a firmware update uh, on my $250 phone uh, this morning, so we'll see what that does to the camera performance. But pre-orders are still up for the iPhone XR, and uh, I want to say that starts at $750. Should you be in the mood to not buy the most expensive phone available? From Apple today. Hmm. What uh, what are you carrying currently, phone wise? I'm still on like an eight plus. <laughs> I just I don't need I don't really have a need to update. The phone still works, right? You know, screen screen's big enough for me. I don't need the I don't need the Face ID. So I'm happy with my home button and my uh, my fingerprint sensor. <laughs> Is good for now. Yeah, I'm kind of <laughs> curious. I don't know. I it's uh, if anything gets me off of this phone, it'll be uh, it'll definitely be the uh, the camera off the Moto G6. But it's it's still pretty good. Oh my goodness! So you guys are obviously having an exciting week of transition of PC per. Is there anything you can tease that's coming up, or are you just going to try to make sure the building doesn't spontaneously you know burst into flames? upon Ryan's departure. Not that he would do that, but maybe there would be some sort of hellmouthy kind of reaction from the building. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're pretty much working on the latter stuff right now. Um the hellmouth. <laughs> uh, I know Ken's testing uh, a whole bunch of stuff, which means that there's going to be uh some uh, I'm thinking CPU stuff coming up. Um I'm getting a few more uh working through a backlog of some storage pieces I need to get out the door, so probably Next one up will be BPX Pro. Uh, pretty good budget SSD for you know, relatively low cost for relatively high performance. Um, and, uh, you know, see where things go. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Well, welcome to the show. My new permanent <laughs> part-time, my new no longer part-time permanent co-host. My permanent, uh, I don't know, this is complicated. Uh, welcome on board, Alan, obviously. Uh, Everybody's familiar with your work, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Ryan, if he hasn't left the building weeping and longing for being part of the podcast, uh, you'll be missed, dude. And uh, you are amazing to work with, and go crush it at Intel. With that, ladies and gentlemen, twit.tv slash twitch is the place to go to find all the links and information about the show you've been listening to. We're called This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch for short. Uh, that was Alan Malventano. I'm Patrick Norton, and you're looking at the webpage where you can actually find all of that information. If, ladies and gentlemen, you'd like to find more of Mr. Malventano's work, I suggest you go to PCPer.com, which is the hardware website. Recently, until recently, run by uh, Ryan Stroud, but now Ken and Allen and the rest of the crew are taking it over. If you want to find more of me, and I can't imagine why, but thank you, TechThing, T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G.com, is my primary show, a weekly tech show I do with Shannon Morse. And you can go over to avxl.com if you want to talk about TVs and projection and all the good stuff about audio, whether it's headphones or surround sound or anything in between. We are there for the experience, and we don't care what your budget is. We want to make it better for you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Alan Malentano. And we'll see you next week on Twitch.